All right, welcome everyone. Um, it's so nice to see you here. Um, and just before I begin my remarks, I wanted to let you know that we're recording this event and it will be posted eventually at some point, so not immediately, but there will be a recording available um, just for GDPR purposes. So welcome here at King's College London, literally and virtually. Um, we're really excited to host Karine um, Coté-Boucher and her new book, Border Frictions. Um, I'm Alvina Hoffman, and I'm a final year PhD student in IR at King's College London. And um, I wanna begin my remarks by just thanking um, King's College London and the brilliant communications teams um, who has been helping us organize this event. And we're co-hosting this event with the Research Center in IR and the IR and Ethics Research Group in the Department of War Studies. So thanks to Pablo and Becca if you're here. And also a really special thanks to Professor Claudia Aradao, who is heading our ERC funded project, Security Flows, and you'll hear about that more um, in a couple of minutes. So just a few notes on the schedule and house, housekeeping, um, so you know what to expect in the next uh, one and a half hours or so. Uh, Karine will present her book for about 40 minutes, and then um, this will be followed by brief comments from Dr. Sarah Perret. Then we'll take several rounds of uh, questions from a brilliant virtual audience. And you can ask a question either by using the Q&A um, function or raise your hand and simply speak and um, tell us what your questions and comments are. Um, we also have a nice little surprise for everyone attending. Um, Kelly managed to get a nice 30% uh, discount code um, for her book. Let me just pop that into the chat. Uh, let me see, here we go. So hopefully that's all that's appearing. It's the BF227 and you can just enter that on the Rutledge website. Um, and that should be available for a year. So yeah, no rush, but do buy the book. It's really great. All right, so that's it for, for now. Now I'm gonna introduce my most esteemed colleague, Sarah Perret. Um, Sarah is gonna chair and moderate this event um, in a couple of minutes. Um, she's a research associate at the Department of War Studies, and she's a part of our Security Flows project. Um, she holds a PhD from the University of Paris-Saclay, and, and in her doctoral thesis, she compared the securitization and legislative changes on naturalization in Germany, the US, and France. Um, she also spent some time at Georgetown during her doctoral studies, and then she worked as a postdoctoral researcher at the Ecole Normale Supérieure in Paris um, on a project around risk and knowledge on societal security. And she's also still a um, researcher at the UNS. Um, she also served as a parliamentary advisor at the French Parliament and as a World Bank consultant, amongst many other roles. Um, so I won't be able to do her justice. And her research interests are uh, on critical security studies, migration, citizenship, border policies, counterterrorism, and datification and digital devices. And she has published on all of these topics widely in French and English. So that's it for me. I'm now handing over to you, Sarah. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Avina, for this introduction and, and also uh, for helping uh, to organize the, this event today. Uh, we are indeed very pleased uh, to have Professor uh, Karine Coté-Boucher today for a discussion around her book, uh, Border Frictions, Gender, Generation and Technology on the Frontline. But before to, to introduce you, uh, dear Karine, uh, properly, uh, I would like to, to tell a little bit more about the Security Flows Project, since this event has been organized as part of this five years Consolidator, consolidator grant funded by European Research Council project. Uh, the full name of this project is Enacting Border Security in the Digital Age Political Worlds of Data Forms, Flows and Frictions. And it is led by Professor Claudia Arado here at King's College London at the Department of War Studies. Uh, the project proposes to analyze how datification, the process of transforming our, our everyday lives into quantif quantifiable digital data, is also transforming borders today. Uh, the project team uh, develops a novel interdisciplinary framework to understand how data is generated, uh, exchanged, and contested in border encounters and to investigate the complex epistemic, practical, political, and ethical implications of these transformations. 
to do so, we are building a multimodal model methodology for following the data along migration routes and tracing the production of data forms, flows and frictions. So you understand how it is interesting uh, to have uh, Professor Karen Kotebuche today um, and, and to, to have uh, the, the possibility to hear more about her work since uh, her work is interesting for uh, the project and, and how valuable is the book Border Frictions, Gender, Generation and Technology on, on the Frontline. Uh, before to, to let her the floor, I would like to, to introduce uh, Karen Cote-Boucher. Dear Karine, you are originally a sociologist and anthropologist, uh, but you are now a professor in criminology at the University of Montreal, uh, where you teach on critical approaches to security, critical border studies, and qualitative research methodologies. Your research uh, focuses specifically on border control, migrations, and refugees, as well as the role of customs controls in the monitoring of supply chains. Uh, you are also interested in social and political theory, and we might tell that we meet all these different uh, literatures and influences into this book that you will present today. Uh, you also have published uh, articles in several high rank uh, journals, such as Security Dialogue, Social Politics, uh, the British Journal of Criminology or Theoretical Criminology. And today it is that's your first book that you will present to us that brings together several years of intense research. Dear Karin, the floor is yours for 40 minutes. Thank you again for being with us today. Well, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. It's uh, morning for me, but afternoon for you. Um, thank you for taking the time to attend this presentation. Uh, I have heard from both Sarah and Alvina that uh, uh, it's very busy this year, uh, this week uh, for, for you in, uh, in IR. Um, there are a lot of events, so I thank you very much for, for taking the time to be here. I also wish to thank Claudia Radao uh, for her invitation. Uh, that's really kind of her. And also the Security Flows Project, the Research Center in International Relations. Um, thank you as well to Dr. Sarah Perret and to Elvina Hoffman for their work in making, making this event happen. So thank you to, to the two of you. So I'll just uh, share my screen with you and we'll get started. You'll see it's a small screen screen, but we should be able to follow. Let me know, Alvina, could you tell me if all is good? Thank you. Okay, perfect. So let's get started. Um, so let me start my remarks with a short rendering of my conversation with William. William is an important character in my book. Uh, William is an experienced border officer, and he spent most of his career working in one port of entry located on the eastern Canada-US border. William has spent most of his career in a port of entry located uh, at that, uh, 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 on that port, and he explains to me how things have changed since he started working three decades before. So as he talks, and I spent uh, a few hours with, with William, um, William spent a lot of time talking to me about differences between two generations of officers, younger officers and old officers. And he tells me younger officers now see themselves as what he called a police of the border. William was not too sure how that change came along, but he shared with me a few clues. He said, um, now younger officers are hired um, as recruits and they are being told that they will stand against people of real bad faith. They will fight drug trafficking and crime and find missing children. In fact, William tells me recruits are selected and trained to become law enforcers. They come to work licensed to carry a gun and expecting to catch bad guys. In contrast, experienced officers like William were hired as public servants and they were hired to collect duties and taxes. 
they were gratified to take on what they saw as a protection of the national economy. And um, I won't have time to talk about that, but I've met quite a few officers who still thought that this was uh, an important aspect of their work, even though Canada is part of a free trade agreement with the United States since 1994, even since 1988. So if Semoine crossed the border um, driving while drunk at the time, they could not arrest that person and that made them very frustrated. They were not trained to use physical de uh, defense tactics, nor did they carry firearms or handcuffs. Older officers like to recount that when they were young, their main tool was a, a passport stamp. Now they carry themselves with more than 50 pounds of gear, a navy blue uniform, a bulletproof vest that makes them appear bigger than they are, and military-like leather black boots. So in my book, I ask, um, I wonder, I listen to William, I listen to William and William comes back in the book, right? And then I listen to him and then I really listen to him in my, it, 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 uh, digitally. And then I was wondering, so how did that change happen? How did Canadian border officers come to think of themselves as a police of the border? So today I will try to present uh, to you and hopefully we'll, we'll have time to go through all of this. Um, the elements um, that um, I use or that I um, talk about in my book relative to border technologies and devices and investigate how these elements uh, can provide some answers to my question. How did we get to uh, border officers who think of themselves as a police of the border? So today, what we'll do together I'll first interrogate a few of our assumptions regarding seamless borders and inquire into specific moments when imaginaries of data fluidity and everyday bordering practices collide, particularly uh, by looking into empirical phenomena such as data distrust and what I call the trickle-down hypothesis. I will then speak about the growing immateriality of border control characterized by the centralization and automation of decision making and how it has set the stage for the emergence of an altered sense of self for frontline border officers. I argue that as an answer to this immateriality, border officers have been embracing new law enforcement tools and a corresponding identity. I then inquire into this shift towards a more rigid and repressive understanding of border control by way of the gun. So more than computers and data flows, this low tech device epitomizes current changes in border control in my country, at least according to the border officers I have met. And I've long wondered why they insisted so much on the role of firearms in border, given that in practice, they don't really use them or barely, right? And that's a good thing. Um, so I offer an explanation which points to the masculinization of border control. So what I present today is based on materials gathered partly between 2010 and 11, when I conducted field work research in and around five ports of entry located at the land border in Quebec and Ontario, so in the eastern part of the country. I also carried more than 30 interviews with Canadian border officials processing trucks and goods, so working at the customs side of the, the CBSA. They were supervisors, border officers, low-level targeters, and intelligence, low-level intelligence analysts. They all work for the CBSA, and, and, and this is important too. That's why I made a little uh, uh, slide for this, because in some uh, countries, um, these activities would be undertaken by different agencies. In Canada, it's a mega, it's a mega bureaucracy. It's a mega agency that takes care of customs, immigration, food and agriculture control, immigration, con well, immigration control in terms of uh, detention and deportation. So anything that has to do with the enforcement of the Immigration and Refugee Protection Act. So all of this is undertaken by the same organization, the CBSA. 
Right. So, but my interviewees worked customs, la, la douane, hmm? and many had done other types of border work before, such as immigration control, because they, they move around. Hmm? So, so that's what it was useful because we could then compare um, what was different between immigration work and customs, for instance. This is completed by documentary research on publicly available materials covering border policy and programs in Canada that I have gathered in the past 10 years, as well as a long term project that I've undertaken on the Canada US cross border trucking industry uh, between 2010 and 2018. Um, so that gave me also some material to to understand more what customs is uh, doing in Canada and the United States. So according to a policy assumption often echoed in scholarship, borders would be rendered seamless by reducing human input and safeguarding a smooth circulation of data between actors that are loosely connected across the policing networks that make up borders. By virtue of this smooth circulation, this data would enable intelligence-led decision-making or as Lisa Moore argues, and I quote, risk-based security technologies appeal to an expansion of forms of knowledge that can always be rendered as actionable intelligence, end of quote. So I'd like today to unpack this assumption with you by asking, how does data circulate in border spaces and how actionable is this data? In view of my findings, I answer this question with a proposition that somewhat contrasts with that of Amorans and inter uh, interrogates anew the seamlessness of technologized borders. In doing so, I rely on David Hofer, Jean Deveau, and Ragazzi, but also on Bigot's work, and suggest that we contextualize how different bordering actors think about technology and use them particularly when it comes to their social professional dispositions and their social positioning within the bordering world. So one methodological way to go about this is to inquire into points of friction where uh, everyday bordering practices and imaginaries of data fluidity collide uh, or shock and in, turn, uh, and in turn inquire into how this experience feeds back into data collection, into circulation and into analysis. In chapter three, I review a range of issues that uh, make data production and circulation, as well as enactment of bordering decisions, uh, less certain and more fraught. Today, I will concentrate on two frictions, what I call the trickle down hypothesis and as well as uh, officer distrust in the validity of available data. So as I spoke with officers about the steps they took while processing dry, truck drivers that arrived, uh, who arrived at their points, sometimes something surprised me. Officers do not have much access to databases when in their boots. It's changed a bit since uh, 2015 and 16, but generally speaking, what I have to say about uh, about this doesn't change. Uh, uh, that fact doesn't change what I have to say about this. So if uh, officers need to uh, or wish to inquire further into a driver, often they need to send this person to the main office where a colleague would then be able to look into different databases. Right? So my disbelief at learning about this limited data access arose from, or at least my reading of the portrayal of data circulation and border scholarship, which often speculates about the flowing of intelligence and data analyses down to ports of entry, where decisions to allow or prohibit entry would then be enforced. So I call this assumption the trickling down hypothesis. It's based on a mechanistic top-down reading of the dynamics of information flows in security and policing organizations which is not corroborated by research, especially research on, on the police, on policing. 
As we know from the works on James and Shetiki or that of Carrie Sanders, it's often difficult to access data in security organizations for a range of reasons, right? Including hoarding, information silos, lack of interoperability, or even just budgetary limitations that impede the acquisition of costly equipment required to make use of such data in, in, in good ways. But in the boardroom context, this data access problem is furthered by two factors. The first one is efficiency. Border authorities operate customs and much of traveler surveillance under a facilitation paradigm. The objective is clear and simple. Border agencies must process billions of dollars of cargo and millions of air passengers each year. I mean border agencies worldwide, right? So following agency standards, the time spent at the booth by drivers and travelers can seldom go beyond 30 seconds, at least in Canada, that's the standard, right? Accordingly, having officers search databases would represent an impediment to an expeditious management of global flows. And that's an issue that's well known to officers. For years, this limited data access has been at the center of an ongoing debate between frontline officers their union and upper CBSA management, the later being reluctant to make the necessary investments, or at least from officer's point of view, to uh, facilitate such access. The second factor I, I wish to talk about is prestige. The union's argument in favor, or the officer's union argument in favor of data access can also be explained by the fact that access to data provides prestige in security organizations. The datafication of borders and push for intelligence collaboration has not eliminated the hierarchical and secretive organizational culture of security agencies. For instance, difficulty of access is also compounded by the need to know principle, which continues to be uh, associated with distinct secret clearances uh, or secret clearance levels. So for instance, as stipulated in CBSA documents, and I quote, targeting officers are also limited by legislation as well as regulation and policy in the type of information that they can share with the front line. So those who work on big data tell us that accuracy is not much valued in security organizations, uh, that one data, the validity of one data is not as much important as the intelligibility of instruments used in their analysis. Yet legitimation problems recurrently affect how data circulates and how it's involved in border decisions. When it comes to the intelligibility of data, from whom it has been collected, as well as how and by whom it has been analyzed, are matters debated at the front line, where data knowledge can be met with suspicion. On the one hand, if the operations of scoring tools in predictive security systems remain unknown to the general public, frontline border officers are similarly left in the dark. As a result, it is not uncommon for them to question the dependability of such analyses. On the other hand, officers are acutely aware that much of the data they, that leads to risk scoring and also to preclearance status designations is self-declared by private actors and often not subject to verifications. It, depend on the part, it depends on the program, but in some programs not subject to verification and often out of date. So this lack of confidence in risk evaluations generated from criminal immigration and border crossing data appears as a common thread throughout my interviews. For instance, officers distrust may lead them to pay lip service to targeting and automated inspection recommendations, especially when that which is targeted is contradicted by their experiential risk knowledges of what to search and when. So if data-led decisions are the programmatic horizon within which the frontline must operate, the level of trust in delocalized data analyses shapes whether and how algorithmic recommendations are enacted in practice, thus showing a significant point of friction in data-led bordering where discretion is still very much alive.
So let's talk about discretion just a little bit. Uh, so border officers are uh, un corps professionnel, uh, an occupational group that have long felt proud of their generous, generous discretionary powers. Yet with trends such as targeting and automation, this discretion is slipping away and with it their occupational identity. So the tangible knowledge and sensory skills that are acquired during the, their professional socialization now enter intention with algorithmic forms of knowing the border, but also with the facilitation logic that aims to speed up flows of cargo and people. So modulated targeting and associated malleable understandings of risk assumes a shift in frontline officers' cognitive abilities. So this shift veers them towards a form of abstract thinking, which takes them away from sense-based detection abilities. And these sense-based detection abilities are very important to their training, but also how they see themselves, right? Their capacity to quote unquote, have a sixth sense and catch bad guys, catch people lying, et cetera. The author of the classic In the Age of the Smart Machine, uh, Zuboff, Shoshana Zuboff, reminds us that what, of what we seem to have forgotten, because we're so used to, to have technologies in our lives, right? That is how this shift from the embodied to the cognitive uh, in, in or what she calls in the nature of the effort from the realm of the body to the realm of thought can be profoundly disorienting and disturbing for those who experience it. To paraphrase Eric Sadin, computerized border work aims to quote unquote eradicate the sensible in bordering. That is to narrow down officers' flawed or discretionary capacity to deal with ambiguity and to come up with more variable decisions that pay attention to context and replace this capacity with forms of analysis that constrain decision by a more uniform and data-led measurements of risk. So given this, what is the role of officers now that some of their tasks and responsibilities have been taken away given to analysts or transferred even to the transportation sector and other policing institutions. So I explore this question in different ways in chapter four, but let me give you a taste of that answer through a look at uh, some of the daily impacts of the growing abstractness of border work. So let's talk about Jacob or Jacob. Uh, Jacob's story of releasing air cargo manifests from afar illustrates how the pressures that come with the virtualization of border work are experienced. So uh, Jacob was an officer close to retirement when we met and he admitted that he had difficulty using computers and he was not the only one. I met quite a few uh, uh, border officers who admitted that they, they had difficulties uh, using the computers at their, at their disposal. And um, a few years before we met, Jacob started evaluating airport cargo remotely. He had yet to see one of those shipments. So for a few years, he had been evaluating the risk of shipments that he had never inspected, never looked at. So he speaks of his initial confusion and discomfort, and I quote him. We found it difficult at the beginning to do this at a distance we are used to having it visual in front of us. So Jacob is posted in a port of entry in the region where he grew up. He went through his career processing the same set of locally produced commodities and meeting the same truck drivers many times a week for years, some of whom he knew from childhood. Jacob is perplexed by this devaluing of local knowledge in remote decision making, as well as by the shift from seeing the border as a place anchored in a network of kinship and close social ties, which is still is, there's still people living at the border that hasn't changed, but also, the, but within border control, what you see is the shift towards a border that is viewed as a, diffu as a diffuse extended space of flows. Huh? We've, all of us have, many of us uh, uh, have written about this. And so 
IC remotely recommends release of shipment for airports located far from this port of entry. These decisions are dissociated from this, their context of enactment and it fills them with a sense of unreality. The intangibility in officers' work routines brought by the virtualization of border work has been increased by several policies, including those having some ports losing the responsibility for electronic declarations now processed by other ports, as well as including the automation of decisions in the area of custom, especially for pre-release of trucks and in goods. Taken together, these trends reinforce customs officers' separation from the information entering decision making, while magnifying their sense that such decisions are increasingly made elsewhere and that they have less and less uh, say uh, in these decisions. So accordingly, I think it's important that we should not assume an enthusiastic embrace of technologies by everyone in border agencies. In fact, uh, my findings reveal that the experience of computer-mediated border work has led many border officers to view automation and delocalization of decision-making with caution. A delicate issue emerges from customs officers' account of their experience of the virtualization of border work, and that's border. And I hesitated actually uh, include, about including this in, in the book. Um, uh, there are things I did not include in the book to protect my, uh, my informants. Um, and, and telling the story of idleness of, of border workers is, can also, um, raise uh, issues, but those are also workers who are protected and uh, have a union, so they're not going to lose their jobs. That's why I decided I'll put it in there. Um, but it is something that really uh, is happening, and I saw that. What, I, I, I don't know this is unheard of in the case of border uh, guards working in business, uh, busy international airports, especially uh, pre-COVID, it's, <laughs> it's not the case anymore, but until March 13th in Canada, at least it, it, it's the case. And so um, it is more likely to be part of everyday work in the custom sections of, of land port of entry. Those facing the removal of some of their prerogatives and related tasks share their, their frustration at being unoccupied for long stretches of time. While it varied from port to port, this inactivity appears to be one of the most tangible effects of a reduced workload due to automation and preclearance. So for example, um, I was having a discussion with Raymond, a mid-carrier officer, who was telling me jokingly, you know, I asked him, so what changed a lot since you started working here, which was like basically 20 years ago or something. And he said, um, oh, you know, before it took 10 people to screw the light bulb here, now it takes one. So I started laughing, I thought it was funny, but then I, I asked him, it's like, okay, so what do you do all day then? And he looks at me and he says, we sit around and we wait for a truck. So I thought he was quite honest, right? but this is it. Um, so when you look at all of these things, the tediousness, that a distrust, and about the feeling of powerlessness, the sense of dislocation, um, sense of boredom, and all of this speaks to more intangible effects of disembodied border work. As I listen to officers trying to pit, pin down the abstract character of their work and what this meant for them, it was difficult to shape, at least for me, the impression of meaninglessness that emerged from their narratives. As a result, the experience of customs at a distance could lead to a potential disengagement of border officers at the front line, and it probably does in some cases. But this is not the most significant reaction elicited in officers confronted with this new state of affairs. Ultimately, bordering at a distance is accompanied by the need to redefine the occupational identity of frontline personnel. Officers are in search of new ways of making sense of bordering and of their place in it. So I, I explained that long in, in a longer way in the book, but um, I, what I tried to get at is how that new sense of, of themselves 
um, is increasingly uh, emerging through a reactive vision of border work. Uh, one that insists on the need to maintain a physical presence at the land border seen as a last line of defense. And I show in chapter four how this relies on a series of strategies, uh, including deploying a language that renders the more intuitive aspects of the job, quote unquote, scientific. Reframing discretion as a response to complexity in the wake of automation and re reinterpreting discretion as a symbolic wage. And I won't have time to talk about this now, but we can have a, a longer discussion after uh, my presentation about this, if, if you'd like. But together, these strategies aim to reestablish concreteness in border work, but also to regain professional recognition for border officers. And they thus function as new status claims in frontline bordering. And they don't therefore set the stage for an altered sense of self to arise. And I have found that a core element that speaks to this turn towards a more repressive understanding of border work is the gun. Let me take a sip of water. So let's start our consideration of gendered border politics with a question. Why do border officers insist that the introduction of the firearm is the most important change they have witnessed in their career? This insistence left me so confused. Some officers were convinced of this even though they were not yet armed themselves or could not be armed because they were injured and to be able to do armed training, you need to be physically fit. So there was a disconnect between uh, this ins insistence and the ways in which also they describe the very administrative character of their work. Customs work is very paper-based and, and computer-based, but in ways of forms, but forms, right? Um, so uh, really, I, I, I took uh, many, many, many walks in the woods <laughs> trying to figure that one out. And so I wrote chapter five to try to understand the place that the gun took in officers' view of themselves, of their bodies, their work, and of the border. And I argue in this chapter that arming is part of what Rewin Connell calls a project of masculinity, which brings into bordering the more conventional understandings of manhood associated with guns. In Canada, the officer's response to their demotion in status and authority has come to rely on one of hegemonic masculinity's most traditional and obvious symbol, the gun. This is significant because these legitimate means of violence, at least when they are used by state uh, officials, are embedded with potent gendered meanings. I also see armed bordering as a straight channel for what Wendy Brown calls the masculinism of the state. That is, and I quote her, features of the state that signify, enact, sustain, and represent masculine power as a form of dominance. End of quote. Sorry, got too fast. In Canada, the officer's response to, sorry, so as technical know-how is uh, increasingly brought into border control. So we know, uh, we study technologies. So it, technologies in borders are ubiquitous, but they also deploy forms of domination that are associated with the high-tech world and the knowledge economy. Um, that's also something that we could definitely look into through a lens of gender border politics. And I didn't do that in the, in the book because I needed to talk about the gun, but I think someone else should be doing it <laughs> sensibly. Uh, but uh, what uh, the idea here is that um, despite this, despite that form of domination through high tech, right, the firearm provides a different mode of legitimation for frontline border work. And that legitimation has less to do with controlling at a distance the flows of people, goods, and money, then with reframing the border as the last line of defense to be protected against bad guys um, through sheer strength and firepower. So in the book, I suggest that arming contributed to the masculinization of border work in Canada. 
but how does one make border work masculine? I say that there's work that needs to be done to gender the border, uh, border work as a masculine type of work. So I provide three different answers throughout the book. First of all, it can go through a change of perception of what border work should be about. Secondly, it can be um, through working through gendered constructions of authority and competence. And thirdly, it can go through altering officers' embodiment through law enforcement tools. Um, today, I'll speak to the first of these elements. So the change in the perception, perception of border work away from a tax and duties collection job and away from the cultural norms, the gendered cultural norms that sustain that perception. So the story I tell in chapter five starts with how officers have come to adopt a gendered take on the recent history of bordering in Canada, citing not the computer, but the firearm as an emblem of the transition, which took them from a feminized past of bordering, what they as, that's how we talk about it, made of administration and taxation to a present or more masculine, stronger, tougher present of security in law enforcement. A few officers told me such gendered accounts of change when they tried to explain how their work had transformed. So let's, uh, let's look at what Nathan told me. Uh, so I'm going to quote to you a, a longer um, excerpt of a conversation I've had with Nathan, who is a, an experienced um, border officer. So Nathan tells me, it's not at all like what it used to be. So I asked him, no, what was it like before? He says, my pretty, well, one of our ministers, Eleanor, mm, Eleanor can't remember her last name. She called us grocery clerks. So I say, ah, oh, Kaplan, grocery clerks. Nathan answers, she said, well, Canada Customs is just no more than grocery clerks or bank clerks or something like that. We just collect duties and taxes, that's it. We don't do enforcement, drunk drivers, we just ask them not to drive. Just park your car in secondary, we'll get you a cab. Yes, so everything has changed since I've been here. So I say, I'll computerize, right? And he's like, yeah, I computerize everything now, guns duty belt, officer powers, power to restaurants, everything. And note that last sentence, that um, enumeration of enforcement tools to talk about the transformation of bordering came back in so many of my interviews. And that enumeration changed. Sometimes it, it, guns were always there, but uh, blue uniform, handcuffs, control tactics. But every time they wanted to talk about what had changed in their work, they talked about their bodies and what they carried on their bodies and what they were trained to use, that concrete material they were using on an everyday basis. So in what he was, what Nathan was telling me, uh, he's recalling a 2002 episode, so it's dating, it's 18 years now, uh, involving then Federal Customs and Revenue Minister. So the CBSA was created in 2003. That's just before the creation of the CBSA. And Customs was there, was there for an agency uh, placed under the Revenue Ministry. Now, since 2003, the CBSA is under the responsibility of public safety in Canada, which also is, tells you a little bit about how it became, border became a security matter. But nevertheless, in 2002 and before, Customs was a responsibility for uh, the Revenue Minister, who was at the time Elinor Kaplan, under whose authority many of my interviewees uh, worked at the time. So Minister Kaplan's comments about bank clerks, so what she, the term she used was bank clerks, were made in the context of a directive to let armed and dangerous individuals, that's a category in um, bordering in Canada and border enforcement, so armed and dangerous individuals into the country, since border officers were not armed and thus considered improperly equipped to intervene in such situations. Following these comments, the officers union received a deluge of phone calls from angry members 
complaining of being compared to simple clerical workers. So the minister's observation generated outrage precisely because working as a bank teller is known to be a feminine occupation. The trope of the bank teller exemplifies in the minds of many the clear gender segregation of jobs in the service industry. So in their bid to secure their position as chief border control actors and obtain pay increases and better working conditions, and they did get that after 2006 when the gun policy was adopted, then the union renegotiated better working conditions. Um, it, it, all of this I, I describe in that chapter, I won't have time to, uh, to talk about it, but it's important that guns are about social status, okay? And about material benefits. And so officers in their union have used arming as a strategy to take a distance from this clerical image, rather insisting on the dangers they might face at the border and boasting of their crime control credentials. They have succeeded in convincing politicians and border high officials that these weapons are, were necessary to their work. And firearms started being introduced for border officers in 2007, and that is still ongoing. To quote Carlson, who did research on private gun ownership in the US, and I quote her, what guns did protect against was a gendered threat, the threat of falling down the masculine hierarchy, end of quote. My interviews, as well as analysis of the union's position on arming, suggests that this masculinization of the purpose, practices, and material culture of border work is intimately linked to efforts to raise officers' occupational profile. In short, arming aimed to recast the public perception of border officers, but also their own, both in terms of a newly self-ascribed gender subject position as law enforcers, and in relation to their efforts to project themselves as still relevant border actors. In turn, that strategy and those gender narratives have made it easier for border authorities, as well as the general public in Canada, to imagine border work as a tougher and more physical endeavor. So, um, I've been talking for a little while. It's time to stop. So um, just to conclude very quickly, um, I make some conceptual interventions in my book in relationship to what I've just told you. you you'll be able to find that and, and read a little more about it in chapter one of the book. Um, and you can also ask a bit questions about this if you are if you're interested and um, I thank you very much for for your time your uh, and your quality of listening and I look forward to discuss with you now thanks well thank you thank you so much uh, Kain, um for this particularly uh, exhaustive presentation um, of all this work uh, I would like to, to, to start uh, by saying how I really enjoyed uh, reading this book. Um, I have to admit it is difficult not to be impressed uh, by all the data collected, uh, whether it is in the number of interviews and participant observation with Canadian border officers you have conducted, or whether it is reading the legislation on taxation, regulation, or administrati administration um, at the border. Um, so I will comment and, and try to, to raise some questions uh, regarding uh, uh, what I find very interesting uh, in the book. I have many questions, but of course I will try to be quick uh, in order to, to let people um, to, to, to ask questions as well, of course. Um, so I, I really liked the, the, the way that you, you, you really uh, demystify here uh, what border work uh, is in everyday practices agents uh, by showing how border work is inserted in this complex socio-technical, organizational and infrastructural arrangements uh, that, that faces to, to a lot of different kinds of frictions. <clears throat> 
And uh, the, the friction concept reminds us uh, how it is methodologically important to collect different knowledge and, and observe what is uh, ignored and used in everyday practices and how those everyday practices are also entangled uh, with the implementation of, of what you call low-tech uh, new tools such as guns. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I agree with, with, uh, with your observation uh, that uh, critical literature on technology sometimes forget that digitalization, di digitalization sorry, uh, is not the only objects uh, we should focus on. Um, and coming back uh, to this friction concept uh, that, that you borrowed from uh, uh, Anne Ting, uh, you are observing frictions in five aspects of border work that you have presented, uh, technologies, unions, uh, gender, professional socialization, and generations. Mm -hmm. And I find particularly interesting how those aspects play a role on the power relations into this field of border work and how some dispo dispositions would uh, provide more legitimacy in their interaction first between them, second with their line management, and third with the clients uh, or the, the truck drivers, uh, for instance. I wonder though, um, and that could be probably my, my first question here, uh, how uh, race or at least stereotypes related to origins play a role in these relationships? Did you observe some differences of behavior regarding mm -hmm. these aspects uh, uh, such as you have been able to identify clearly differences in terms of mm. age or gender. Mm. Uh, through the, the entire book, you, you describe precisely um, all the process of customs practices, uh, sometimes through uh, what you have been able to observe directly, sometimes through the descriptions of the main stakeholders uh, of these processes. Um, these two ways allow to, to catch probably more precisely the reality of practices than just having testimonies or, or just observations. Mm -hmm. uh, but both ways are, are facing difficulties of fieldwork access. And it is here my second question. Um, how did access this uh, fieldwork? Um, um, what were your strategies here um, mm -hmm. and, and how these ways of accessing this field affected your interaction with the field and its actors? Mm -hmm. um, I guess as an anthropologist, this is a, a question that you have kept in mind during your mm -hmm. um, <laughs> investigation. Oh, <yeah. laughs> okay, well, good uh, questions <laughs> and you might not know, but they are interconnected. Exactly, exactly, um, I'm sure. Um, because uh, when I um, when I started uh, the research or when I tried to start the research, um, I developed the, the research project to look at customs and not immigration control yeah. because I thought I would never get research access mm -hmm. or it would be difficult to. Uh, also, because at the time, Anna Pratt, who is a really good social, uh, social legal scholars in Can uh, scholar panel in Canada, uh, has already worked, had already worked on race, uh, race and risk knowledges at the border, and um, I, I wanted to uh, steer away from that and want to get into her territory, if you wish. Right? Um, so th those are the two reasons why I didn't have a lot of access on uh, to um, how border decisions integrate uh, stereotype stereotypes, mm -hmm. racialized stereotypes, for instance. I can tell you, though, from later research with truck drivers, um, I've spoken with Sikh truck drivers, so South Asian truck drivers from the Sikh community, uh, who are, I don't know whether that's the case in Europe, but in Canada, um, uh, there's a niche for truck driving for Sikh uh, truck drivers. So uh, in Ontario and in British Columbia, and a bit in, in Montreal as well, actually. Uh, and, and I was talking with them and then they were telling me, oh, everybody has had a story at the border with border officers, right? treating them badly. And I was like, this is interesting because I've interviewed 50 people before you and no one tells me this. And they say like, really? Like, yeah. 
So seek truck drivers. And I said, so those are your friends and are your friends, tell, friends who are telling you this, are they seek? Mm -hmm. And they say, yeah, they are. Huh? So they're all South Asians. Yeah. And so um, the, the, the experience, at least, of my, uh, of my interviewees, of the clients, right, um, is really racialized. But we know this. We know this, right? This is not something we... <laughs> this is not, you know, but uh, th there are elements here where uh, doing research on these things at the border, it, it, I think we need to um, look at it from the perspective of clients, of the perspective of border crossers, but they are clients as well, especially truck drivers. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, you know, there, there's a dynamic of, of uh, the private, private companies as well, wanting uh, their uh, commodities to go through borders quickly so that also has an impact but anyway that's another research project but that's also to answer your question right now in terms of um, uh, research access um, well I you, you mentioned I'm an anthropologist by training uh, I, I, I still think that uh, despite globalization we still all live in a village we and we do like most of us in the world. If you really, if you read uh, even the research about how many people we know and in which area of the world they live, it's generally around 100 kilometers from where from where we live, right? Um, and so my research strategy uh, used that and used networks and family networks. And uh, I basically took two years, uh, the beginning of my PhD, and I've been annoying with everybody I've met asking them, do you know anybody who works for the CBSA? So parties, family gatherings, Christmas, anything, I asked everybody. And I finally two contacts panned out. Uh, one through uh, uh, my in-laws, uh, extended family. But I will tell you this because it's important. I don't know if mm -hmm. students are, are listening right now, but I think it's important. It's like a lot of people ask me, oh, should I write a letter to the CBSA or to the US CBP. I'm like, no, that's the last thing you should be doing, right? <laughs> you have to find people who trust you, huh? right? And people will trust you if they know your mother. I'm sorry to say this, but that's still the way it is, right? Mm -hmm. And so, um, uh, through my in-laws, uh, in law really extended family, someone in that extended family had gone to high school with a border officer. She put me in contact with him and he said, oh yeah, that looks awesome. Let me put you in contact with my chief of operation. And I went to meet him and he had gone, he had a, a friend who had done a, a PhD research in anthropology in Peru. And therefore he thought, oh, I'm really, I'm gonna help the student here, right? And the second a way I, I, I got uh, research access was through a friend or colleague of my mother whose um, uh, father was a, a border officer, right? So, um, it, and then these people had helped me then get a proper authorization. Of course, I wouldn't have been able to, uh, to, to do that research without uh, at least the, the provincial um, regional direction uh, agreement or approval. So I got that. And that also had an impact. Ask you about, not only you asked me about strategies, but how it affected my interactions. Yeah. Since early until the, so for the past 10 years, I lived in fear. <laughs> because, uh, because I was wondering whether I would um, eventually lose access or if uh, the CDSA would be saying, you can't publish this or, you see, uh, uh, so it always um, stayed in the back of my mind. Yeah, definitely. And it had, we have to admit, it had an impact on how I, I, I wrote my dissertation, uh, how I wrote different papers. I've, I've tried to be very nuanced and careful and, and also I mean, kind to the people who have been generous enough to, to spend time to talk to me, right? But yeah. Thank you for, for your answer. I, I still have, um, other question, but uh, maybe um, uh, I will let the, the floor to to the to the person who wants to to ask question. Av Avina, uh, is there yeah, a I can questions? Take yeah, I think we already have two questions by Claudia Aradao. Um, Claudia, I don't know if you want to come in live or if you want me to read your question out loud. If there's a way for you to come in now, 
Uh, I think, yes. I think I hear. Would you like, did you, uh, I think you or Claudia? Claudia, Claudia. Okay. Hi. Um, so I, I think you might hear me. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay, brilliant. Hi, Corinne, and thank you Hello. so much for the talk. Um, yeah, it was amazing. And a bit like uh, Sarah, I also have a lot of questions, but I'll try to restrain myself a little bit. Um, so um, one of my questions that also maybe resonates with um, Sarah's earlier comment was about the concept of friction, which I found really exciting. And there is a bit of work, but not so much engaging with the concept of friction. And I was wondering about how you use the concept mm -hmm. um, and you, because you, you said that you chose frictions right and I was wondering what work the concept did for you in the book mm -hmm. particularly as for instance if we take data distrust as one side of friction I was wondering why is data distrust friction because somebody could I mean the board officers could distrust data but do nothing about it right so mm -hmm that there isn't necessarily yeah. friction mm. yeah. um and the second point was about how you kind of tackle the what i saw as a, a kind of contradiction between this image of immaterial borders through uh, through virtualization computerization datification right? almost like the lightness of borders on the one hand and the kind of materialization of borders through all this gear that you started with the gun the heavy gear right so we have this very different um you know representations and i was wondering are these the representations that the border officers are giving you because in a sense digitization computerization is also a materialization right it comes with particular experts people mm. who need to do the data work with devices the computer is a device with kind of data storage i assume also files and so on um yeah so i was wondering about this if you could say more about this contradiction but also potentially oui. different materialization and for mm. whom oui. thank you Claudia. Yeah. we have two more questions um let's take them this round and then we'll let you answer and then we open up for another round so i have martina tazioli do you want to come in yeah uh, it's fine can you hear me okay <laughs> Uh, hi, thanks a lot uh, for the wonderful presentation. I haven't read the book yet, so I cannot uh, comment on it. But from what you said, I was wondering if you can say something more about, well, the, the first question is connected to what Claudia mm, just asked. So it's not, not specifically about the concept of friction, but in general, you explain the fact that <clears throat> data circulation is not smooth and uh, that there are all these interruption, right, border interruption. And I was wondering, because there is a growing literature around uh, interruption, friction, disruption in, uh, in data circulation, and how politically and conceptually, um, wh what do you do with that, right? So after um, noticing and uh, highlighting these frictions or interruption, um, it, what, what is relevant for you, right? So what is uh, at stake? Um, uh, what shall we get from that? from this interruption, where, where, where does it go? This, uh, because interruption can be also, uh, I mean, counter strategic for, I mean, I'm speaking about migrants, you, in, not necessarily about migrants, even customs or people in general cross the border is not just an interruption of our power function, but at the same time, yeah, I was wondering what do you do with this um, analysis? And the second question is about, so you, you, you engage with this, um, but, um, you explained to us very well this partial immaterialization of uh, border words and, and this disappearance of, of the body. And I was wondering if in the book you say something, um, so not only about the gender dimension, but the fact that actually these, not only these bodies are there, but the, there is a, a restructuring in the labor economy of the border. So of the, la of the way in which, of the kind of, um, uh, labor that these people perform that is constantly invisibilized and not only their labor as uh, people who police the borders but also as people who yeah who are part of a labor economy so which kind what about uh, this dimension and the third and final point is about your level of analysis so do you think that this uh, technologization of borders is something that is at play 
only at that level that you investigated or that uh, as long <laughs> no, uh, keep going i'm sorry <laughs> because well uh, then it depends on the, the 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 research side but for instance in yeah in some of the research i've done i can understand that there is also a lot of non-technological borders that is enmeshed with this technologization so it depends really which which people you interview mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Let's let's take those questions for now because I think there are a lot of questions, more than three, and then we'll open the second round with um, Mireille Paquet and some more questions, just pop them in the Q&A. Otherwise, I will just ask my questions. Okay. Um, so, uh, questions about friction and data circulation. Um, no, it, it's true. Like, there's not always frictions. That is, of course, like, sometimes you do not um, you see that uh, they will, they'll, for example, board officers say, I get a targeting recommendation. And then I think it's stupid, but <laughs> I'll implement it. Like, I'll go, I'll do it. But where the friction happens is how I will do it, right? I'll do it by opening one box instead of five. I'll do it by taking my time. I'll do it by uh, not paying attention too much, right? Or I will just not do it that much, right? Um, then it can happen uh, in ways where um, the friction can happen. For instance, I saw that in one port. Well, I saw, I, I heard about it in one port. So uh, at the time, there were systems of um, uh, that pre-cleared automatically 50 to 60 percent of um, trucks and commodities that went through ports of entry. That, that's what happens in customs, right? Most, m most of these things are now automatically uh, evaluated and not by people. Right? just by systems that, and so there's an algorithm that works. And at the time it was done by ports of entry. And so by one person, a border officer would apply for that job and say, I wanna be a low level analyst and I want to deal with that preclearance system that deals with my, uh, what happens at my port. And at that specific port, what happened is for an entire year, the border officer was in charge of that, um, uh, that system was overwhelmed. He, he couldn't cope. And so everything that uh, that system was uh, basically out of date for more than one year, he couldn't enter new, uh, new data in it. Um, and so what happens to those systems is that after a while, they will therefore provide targeting um, uh, material to officers uh, on the ground but the officers are using targeting, uh, forms of targeting that are uh, out of date, that just, they don't have, a, um, there, there's no link to the reality. So what I'm trying to say is that these systems are in friction with reality in a way. That is, they can, or they can become so, they can create their own autopoietic reality, their, no, their own self-referential reality. And I think that is extremely dangerous. We should pay attention to this. We should actually investigate this. Uh, the, uh, that these systems, like we know, like Madame um, Tazini, uh, uh, who just, I read, I read your work, and your work shows that very well, that it's, this is not, um, this, this does not happen in real time. And so all decisions are being made on the basis of information that is not verified, often old, um, often repetitive, uh, often uh, even with mistakes, lots of mistakes in data entry. Um, and so there's, there's the friction here between us who <laughs> cross borders and these systems who are creating another reality through risk rationalities, right? So that's, that's one friction between us and, and, and those systems. And I think we should pay attention to that. I mean, there's lots of other examples, but I think that one is, uh, I, ho I hope I 
I was clear in my explanation, but I think that one is, is, is an important one. And so the, the self-referential aspect of those system is one um, element that I think we need to start talking and thinking about. Um, You know, to Claudia, you asked another question about the materiality of borders. Are we the different forms of materialization and that digitalization also uh, involves a material component? Yeah, and you can see it, of course, in, in, in the work, the daily work of border officers. Um, when they told me, you know, before we had those stacks of papers that we had to deal with, now we spend six hours in front of computer screens to uh, process forms. Right. And so there's a new materiality in, 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 in the, the work. This being said, I was more interested in what made sense to them and what types of materialities um, made up their symbolic world. And computers was not that. It, it was their, it, it, what the materiality of their lives uh, on a daily basis was law enforcement tools and what they looked like and how, how they felt uh, as embodied subjects. Uh, and it doesn't mean that that's more important. And I'm not saying this is more important as a form of materiality, but it is a, an important one that we have not paid enough attention to, I think. And in, in, in it's important when we talk about how policing enforcement, but also militarization of borders uh, is happening everywhere. It's also happening through this. Uh, that sense of the self that is increasingly going towards materialities that are um, relative to uh, the work of policing or even the work of the military. Um, and uh, just one last thing, uh, your, your, your question uh, about um, levels of analysis in, in technologies and where it's happening. And yes, uh, you're right. That is what I'm talking about is uh, looking at what's happening at the frontline level and that's the title of the book because I wanted to make sure that this was really understood and so if we look at the work of other people who have looked at uh, people who worked at the targeting level or even people who have worked at the on the develop on the development of um, border technologies. I, I'm thinking of the work of Bourne, Lyle, and uh, Johnson on laboratizing the border. You see that there are these different levels of people with different uh, credentials, secret credentials, different social dispositions, and they will have all different understandings of the border of technologies and of the way, and they will also interact with technologies very differently, and they will have different knowledges relate, relative to technology as well. Um, so, yeah, I hope uh, I've been answering correctly uh, to your question. Thank you. Thank you. What a great round of questions. Um, we already have three more questions, Karin, so get ready for another round. Um, Mireille Paquet, um, do you want to come in or shall I just read out your question? I'll give you a couple of seconds. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Great. Um, thank you, Karin, for a great presentation. Um, it's very... Uh, very complex, but also very suiting the way it's presented. And the work is obviously uh, fascinating with deep engagement with, um, with, with the actual lived experience of the border agents. And so uh, thank you for that. Um, my question has to do with um, what your work can tell us about the changing nature of administrative structures associated with border enforcement. So you document a period of change at uh, in Canada's um, CBSA, but I mean, we've seen that in several other countries with those agencies moving, either becoming autonomous or being merged with other, um, with, with other agencies. And um, this, yeah, so I just would like you to tell us beyond Canada, I think that the book really documents that, but what can the results and what can your book tell us about the impact of the, the evolution of these structures. Great, thank you. Um, next, I have Didier Bigot. Didier, do you want to come in? Hello? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, yeah. hello, Karin. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I didn't... Uh, 
I didn't listen to all, all the all the lecture, but I had the advantage to read the book. And uh, I, I wanted to ask you one of the question uh, concerning the lived experience of the the border guards and the fact that in fact uh, in some of my interviews uh, I've seen the border guards not only at the ground level but more and more at other levels where they were not previously. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, you have now an agreement between the Five Eyes country on migration. And it's a memorandum of understanding, but the different ministries, which are in charge, very often interior, but sometimes really the one on migration, uh, share elements and share strategy at the ground level. And so uh, it's often different channels and the ones of border guard or it was like that but it seems that more and more they are meeting together so you have a, a, a bizarre mix of meetings where you have a top border, border guard really online ones of some uh, big uh, airport or local communities uh, discussing with the intelligence uh, community mm -hmm. so uh, do you know uh, about that in, in Canada or, but have you, have you seen the, the memorandum of understanding of the different No, but I'll, uh, I'll, I'll answer after, but thanks. Yep. Thank you so much Didier. And last, uh, a really long question by Miguel Iglesias Lopez. Do you want to come in and maybe ask it live Miguel? Just unmute yourself, Miguel. Miguel. Well, maybe, maybe. But I can read. read I can read them, so I can answer uh, after that. It's on my screen. As he has the microphone. All right. Ah, uh, so, okay, that's fine. Yeah, I'll, I'll let you. Yeah, it's probably easier if you read it than me reading it out loud. And then. Okay. Great. Okay. So, you um, and then first, first the question uh, by Mireille on uh, changing the changing nature of administrative structures. Um, but that's something that I'm learning with Mireille. Mireille is a friend, she's nice, she's here as a moral support. Um, she's also a, a, a really uh, important uh, political scientist in, in Canada and she knows way more about administrative structures than I do. Um, listen, uh, Mireille, um, I think what we're seeing is um, the evolution of, of uh, border structures towards uh, either a mandate of securitization or a mandate of policing or a mandate of militaries, a mandate that is military. And, and at the same time, a, ma a mandate of facilitation. And I'd say that in general, <laughs> the facilitation mandate is happening everywhere and it's entering in intention with the other mandate. In Canada, in the law, um, in the customs law, uh, the, the mandate of, of uh, Canadian uh, the CBSA is facilitation and security. But then the way that uh, has been understood uh, at the administrative level um, is interesting because even if we speak a lot of se about security, a lot of money, a lot of the budgets that are being spent in Canada on bordering actually are spent on trade and passenger facilitation, including in terms of, of technologies to, to make that happen more quickly. Right? Uh, so in terms of structures, what you're seeing as well in Canada and in some areas is first a transfer of some responsibilities that were uh, understood as immigration responsibilities to border agent, a border agency like the CBSA. So those responsibilities being those of the immigration ministry before the creation of agencies like the CBSA. Or what you're seeing as well is um, a trans, I'd say a tumbling down of the response of responsibilities for a lot of things in customs and in immigration to um, private and public actors, but lower 
lower than the federal level, either at the provincial or at the municipal level. You see that in Canada, you see that elsewhere. And that has an impact on how, for instance, these um, private organizations, not-for-profit, and the private, I mean, transportation industry, for instance, will have a, a interactions with these border structures in terms of data exchange, but also in terms of public organizations like the police having, uh, we see that in Montreal, for instance, uh, having uh, exchanges of data uh, between the CBSA and, 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 and police uh, municipality, uh, small exchanges, but uh, uh, especially on, on, on immigration status. Um, so what you're seeing is a recomposition, I think, of the relationships between border, border agencies and lower levels of, of decision making, uh, but also with um, private sector and the, the civil society, uh, civil society in general. And, and I think that's not only Canadian. I think we've seen, we're seeing it in the U.S. For instance, and the, the, the work of uh, Doris Marie Prov uh, Provine is, uh, is really good on this. Yeah. Um, Didier, I, I had not heard about this. Now you, you are my go-to person for uh, anything you five by and intelligence related. Um, so, um, but uh, you talked about the lived experience of border guards and how, um, we see these people going up um, from, you know, an experience as border officer and go up. And actually, in Canada, um, this is no longer the case. That is, before it wasn't, uh, you could see border officers, or no longer, less the case. You could see border officers before, or who, those who are called customs officers, go up the hierarchy all the way to Ottawa and have more administrative uh, positions. You see that less now. People who work in Ottawa and in administrative positions for the CDSA uh, have master's degrees and are hired directly from, from universities. Uh, this being said, it, 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 it'd be interesting to see like that mid-level management uh, in airports and, and, and what happens there. Um, but you know, I, I'd like to say something about this because uh, another thing, um, you know that at least in Canada, to become a targeter, you don't necessarily need to have such a, a good understanding of, of, of data and technologies. Um, you can, for instance, become a low level analyst if you've been injured on the job and you need to be re uh, positioned somewhere because you are unionized and you are therefore deserving to keep your job. And so some of those positions, uh, that analyst positions, are actually filled by uh, former border officers, not on the basis of necessarily qualification, but on the basis of need, uh, the needs of, of, of these injured workers. Um, so that's something also to think about terms of data flows and, and smoothness of, of borders. But uh, uh, could you send me the, the, the link to the memorandum of understanding? If you have it, I'd love to, to have a copy of, of that document. That'd be great, thanks. Um, but uh, the last thing, um, ministries um, at the higher level, you see that Canada and the Netherlands, for instance, are uh, exchanging a lot on pre-clearance programs right now and developing one in conjunction, but that's, happening at a higher level. Um, Canada is always uh, keen to develop more preclearance uh, technologies and, and programs. So uh, that's something that could be interesting to look at as well. So I'm going to read uh, the question by uh, Professor Lopez. Um, mm, uh, why do I use the word programmatic? Uh, Foucault. Uh, Foucault's program. So uh, Foucault says, uh, you know, it, 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 there's a program and there's a reality or things never happen as it was said in the program. And that's why it's so interesting to study, right? That is, uh, the, there's, of course, there's a vision, there's a horizon that technologies uh, and, and automation, especially, um, and centralization is supposed to make decision making smoother at the border. It's supposed to make it less discretionary and supposed to help border office, uh, officials across the globe um, be less corrupt, uh, go faster in, in decision making to, and therefore 
uh, facilitate flows. But what I'm trying to show is that that's a program in Foucault's sense. Uh, and that we need to look at practices and we need to look at how this unfolds, um, not in reality, that it how this unfolds in the relationship between that program and when data emerge and practices emerge and how it collide, they collide, like these practices and that program collide together. And what, and the friction between those two things, it creates something. And that's what I'm interested in. Mm -hmm. So that also gets back to Claudia's question about the friction, right? This is the friction. The friction, the friction is not between a theory and reality. It's between that program that imposes pressures on people and how people interact with this, but also how this influences the cir circulation of data. And you see, it took me a while to answer your question, Claudia, for you, but getting there. <laughs> okay, second question. I need to read it because I haven't had time. I think Miguel said that this was actually already answered as it was linked to Claudia's Oh, question. okay. D'accord. Oh. Perfect. Let's take maybe another 10 minutes because we, we have a few questions left. Um, and we're allowed to use this virtual Zoom room a little bit longer, but then there's another meeting. So I have uh, Georgios Glutsios. Um, do you want to come in and um, ask your question live, Georgios? Yes. Hello. Can you, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. So I actually read the book and I really found it uh, fascinating and uh, beautifully written. So I have uh, two questions. One is related to what Martina said before. The other one is uh, related to the transportation industry. So the first question is like, besides contesting dominant discourses about seamlessly working, supposedly smart borders, why is it politically important to attend to border frictions? So what are the politics of research into friction? This is the first question. Why is it important in terms of critique, in terms of the ways that we come to understand um, the power to control uh, mobilities and mm -hmm. so on. Now, the second question is like you mentioned before that the responsibility for enacting security is often transferred from customs officers to the transportation industry. And I was wondering what are the dangers of this trend? Mm -hmm. What do you think? Right. Okay, so thank you very much. It was really great. I'll use my role as a chair to ask two more questions um, from my side. Um, I only read, you know, the, the, the introduction that was on the Rutledge side. Um, but um, from what I found, um, you really had to do a lot of kind of reflexive work after you've conducted your fieldwork, right? Because you start your book with an acknowledgement of how you actually really liked the actors you were dealing with, right? And you just own it and, you know, really like it. And there's no, you know, there's no need to vilify them for no reason in a sense. Um, so I was wondering whether you could reflect on your strategies of reflexivity and how you manage to deal with this material and with their own kind of, you know, legitimizing discourses and how, how to distance yourself from this and really analyze this from the perspective um, that you did. And then maybe a second question. Um, in the interviews you conducted and in the book, um, are there ever any references to their counterparts on the other side of the border, uh, so to speak? Because obviously there are other, other uh, border guards on the other side, but it seems like they're only kind of referring to mm -hmm. generations within the same um, regime in a sense. So I was just wondering about this kind of um, relationality. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, are there any other questions? One final, that's the final round. So if you have anything to ask or to add, um, please let us know. Doesn't look like it. I have, I have yeah. many other questions, but uh, I will send, send uh, my questions to you directly, Karin. Okay. <laughs> um, so um, about the political question, it's such an important one and one that I'm still thinking about. Uh, probably I'll be thinking about that until I don't until I die, um, uh, because I'm 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 very very uh, pessimistic about uh, political change and bordering. I'm sorry, like I, I, I'm sorry to say that, um, but let's take this question about the political uh, and critique. So first thing, critique. Um, in the book, in the first um, chapter, I, I wrote a note 
And there, there are, I refer to Boltanski to say that there are different levels of critique. And I decided to use a humble level of critique, uh, one that uh, is um, related to looking at what border agencies or institutions of power are telling us about what they're doing in our name and for our for us and uh, and going through sociological description uh, to uh, show that this is not what's happening right um, and and um, so this is not about resistance and this is not about going in the streets to do demonstrations, but this is an approach that uh, uh, that border agencies don't like. Um, and that's also an approach that uh, we have perhaps, we, we do not um, realize that perhaps uh, enough how um, disruptive that approach is because it speaks to the core of the experience of workers um, I, I, of border workers, I, I, I consider them border workers in the book. It speaks to uh, the fact that uh, while they're telling, uh, while border management is telling us and politicians are telling us or whatever, when we're being told that technologies work well and that's how we are being keep, kept safe, right? And that on a daily basis, these technologies just don't work or they don't work the way they're supposed to, or they're getting older and they break and, and there's no money to fix them. And so there's that dream of the border that is so secure, right? And there's a rea reality of it uh, that is much more compli complicated. And I find that um, that's one way um, to look at it. One other way to look at it, of course, is that once you see all these holes in that that very smooth understanding of what the border is there might be room for different forms of alliances um, different forms of uh, also different types of, of political struggles um, before I went to do the research, I, I didn't even think about the importance of firearms and guns, right? And that's because border officers told me about this. And now I realize how important this is. And maybe, I don't know in the UK how important firearms is, but in North America um, right now, the um, firearms are a, a, re a, a real huge issue, right? Especially with the extreme right. And uh, it would be a bit too long to, to talk about this, but politically to have, to give more firepower to different organizations like the CDSA, like the police, like you see it, that is, this to me is a political problem. It's important. <laughs> We've added thousands of guns in our society. Canada is not a heavily armed uh, place, but the U.S. is. Right? And so this brings up new political challenges, other political questions, right, that are perhaps not, of course, it brings up other political questions around immigration and stuff, but those we know, that's why I'm not talking about this, right? But I find that doing research with people and their experience opens up new political questions and, 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 and new political challenges um, that we need to face, uh, I think, collectively. Yeah, at least in North America, it, it, I, I talk about guns and, and maybe in Europe it's less important, but for us it, uh, with Trump and everything, it, it's becoming uh, quite an issue, yeah. So, but yeah, the, the political question just will, it will uh, haunt me until this, my research days will be over. Um, rapidly on the transportation industry, the dangers of the transfer. Actually, for the transportation industry, a lot of the responsibilities are not a transfer, but they've been created by, um, by the CBSA or, um, 
and the US CB, uh, and, and, and the US uh, Custom Border Protection. So, so these are new responsibilities that are roughly 20 years old and they've been developed to integrate the transportation industry within uh, the securitization of supply chains. And the dangers about it are so important. Uh, I, I don't have time to talk about all of them, but I'll, I'll tell you one. Um, right now, and for the past 20 years, the US has sovereignty on, t on, on two Canadian soil in two truck transportation, trucking industry, uh, uh, transportation or transportation uh, companies' yards because of pre-clearance programs. If you want to be able to uh, have access to uh, pre-clearance programs in the US, uh, for the US programs, you need to let US border representatives visit your, your company. Uh, and you need to provide a lot of information that can be quite private, but also commercially sensitive information to US CBP in the Homeland Department, uh, the Department of Homeland Security to be able to So in terms of sovereignty, but in terms also of uh, what this means for the trucking industry and therefore for workers, um, for, for truck drivers, uh, this is uh, uh, quite um, problematic, but we can have a longer conversation about that. And rapidly, um, around uh, refer I, your question about reflexivity was so interesting, Alvina, but I think we were going to not, not have enough time. But in terms of, because the last one I can answer very quickly, uh, references to US border guards. Yeah, it was always in the background. And basically, it, what the background was, US border officers get respect, and we want to become like them. So let's, let's become law enforcers, let's become tougher, and therefore nobody will give us, try it. <laughs> no, no, nobody will, uh, will question our, uh, our authority anymore, right? Um, so yeah, yeah, so you, 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 the US was there. Um, there's more to say about it, unfortunately. I think we're, we're gonna be out of time, but I'd be happy to have a longer conversation with you about it, yeah. Thank you. I'll, I'll pass the word back to Sarah, who will rapidly wrap up. Thanks for everyone who's still with us. Um, we're really excited. It's been such an amazing discussion. Yeah, well, uh, thank you so much, uh, Karin, for, for this uh, brilliant presentation and uh, your, all the response that you, you, you provide today. Uh, again, it's, uh, it's a very fascinating uh, book and uh, as I said earlier, uh, I'm very impressed by all the work that you, you, you were able to, to, to bring together in, into this book. Uh, I also wanted to, to, to thank a lot uh, Alvina Hoffman for uh, chairing this, uh, this event and, um, and again, helping to organize uh, this uh, online uh, presentation. And also, of course, uh, I would like to, to thank the, uh, the School of, uh, of Security Studies uh, at King's College London, who, who has been a great help to, to communicate on, on the event. Well, I think this is the end. Thank you again, Karine. Uh, I wish you the best for the, the book. And hopefully we will be able to meet uh, in person really soon. <laughs> that would be lovely. That would be lovely. So thank you to all of you for, for organizing it. And thank you for the rest of you for your, your great questions and, and for being here. And I, I look forward to meeting you in person uh, for, for those of you I don't know yet. Thank you for the invitation. It was great. Thank you. Thank you to the participants as well and for the great questions. <laughs>